Yeah, good evening, everybody, and, and, and welcome to the fourth of these uh, Livery Committee Literary Cocktails Hour. And tonight, I'm delighted that we've got court assistant Jonathan Drury in conversation with our own uh, Peter Day. Um, as by now, you're probably aware that the Livery Committee initiated what we hoped and has proved to be a very successful uh, season of literary events. These were intended to be informal events away from the hall with authors that are associated with the station's company. And we look forward to hearing about their publications and of course their lives. We were entertained actually a year ago this week in Williamson's Taverns by, um, by Simon Heffer. And with the advent of COVID in, in um, March this year, we moved to these Zoom cocktail hours. The first one was with Christopher McCain and we were delighted with the positive feedback. And these have been followed by equally successful events with Paul Wilson and Margaret Wills. And what's been particularly pleasing from, from my point of view with these cocktail hours is they've been watched by over 400 members now, not only in the UK, but in Germany, the Netherlands, Ireland, France and the USA. And members have, have purchased um, signed books and Lucy and myself have been busy sending these books to all corners of the UK and as I said, outside. And as with the previous um, evenings we've had, you'll have an opportunity to purchase Jonathan's um, delightful book and more about that later. So tonight, again, it's not a literary lunch, it's a cocktail hour. So please feel free to charge your glasses or if you're like Tyler in the USA, have a cup of coffee or maybe an iced tea, sit back and enjoy John in conversation with Peter Day. Peter. Over to you. Thank you, Mike. Let's go straight to Jonathan Rory, the, this evening's author. He's here to talk about a book he published very successfully last year and a little bit about another one that's um, coming out next April. But we'll start with John himself, his very busy life involved in all sorts of things and how his ideas emerged and what we can all learn from them. John became a stationer five years ago in 2015. He joined the court in 2018. He was a judge and then chairman of the judges of the Innovation Excellence Awards. And he's a member of the Education Committee and the Hall Fundraising Committee. And he fostered the stationer's relationship with um, Ravensbourne University, where he was chairman. John, let's start off with you. You grew up in London. Yes, uh, southwest London, um, Twickenham, uh, just by Richmond Bridge. Um, my uh, my parents were uh, sort of uh, first and second generation immigrants from uh, northeastern Europe, and uh, I went to a, a sort of uh, the local primary school, uh, just toddling over Richmond Bridge on my own every every day, and then uh, went to school in Hammersmith um, uh, to Latimer Upper School. And uh, after that, with education? Uh, well, I, I um, went to a sort of thinking person's Butlins, which was the University of Sussex. And um, I did uh, uh, electronic engineering there, uh, which was, I think the reason I did that was because that's what my older brother did. And uh, he seemed to enjoy it. And I, I enjoyed, I, I went through the whole gamut of making everything as a, as a kid. I, I did, uh, you know, every kind of craft, you know, the candle making and macrame and weaving and metalwork and blacksmithing and everything. And uh, so, uh, you know, he was always busy sort of making electronic stuff. And I, I think I, I sort of followed in that. And then electronics got you into the BBC. Yes, I, I, I remember when I was um, uh, just leaving the BBC, they had this thing, uh, leaving university, they had this thing called the Milk Round, where uh, companies would come along to, uh, to the university and sort of uh, recruit people. And, uh, you know, in, in electronics, it was relatively easy, thank goodness, to get a job. And I, I remember I had two job offers, one from the BBC and one from British Telecom International, which was all sort of satellites and, and, and all that kind of thing. And I remember asking my father, um, you know, which one I should take. And, and he said, oh, well, go to where you'll learn most. And uh, I went to the BBC and I was very happy there. But it was only after he died at a, at a good old age um, that I thought back about this man with a rather heavy Eastern European accent. And I, I thought, did he say go to where you'll learn most or go to where you'll earn most? <laughs> but I, I, th I think I probably did what he, he, he was suggesting. 
And that was a sort of engineering job, but you went then into program making fairly quickly. Yes, I, I realized that where the grease paint, the lights, and mainly the girls were, uh, was actually on the program making side rather than the engineering side. And I, um, they had a system of internal attachments, which uh, got you out of this kind of catch 22 problem of not being able to get a job until you'd had experience, but not being able to get experience of a job until you had the job. Uh, so I, um, I got an attachment to Tomorrow's World. Uh, if you remember Raymond Baxter and the silver propelling pencil, it was a little bit after those days, uh, but I, uh, I, I was a sort of duty uh, assistant producer researcher on that for, for a while, and, and that's, that's how my production career started, really. And that was learning rather than earning, particularly, <laughs> wasn't it? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I came from not a very well-off family, so actually, uh, you know, the salary seemed like kind of riches to me, and uh, I, I was perfectly happy. In fact, you know, being paid to do something which was huge fun and which you could talk about to your, your mates and uh, neighbours uh, seemed like a, a, a great thing. And even my dad, who decided that, you know, I should have a proper career in engineering, um, sort of came round to it once, once he saw my, my name on the end of the credits and he thought, oh, well, that, that's it, he's made it. <laughs> now, Tomorrow's World was pretty relentless because it was a, a weekly show and um, uh, an awful lot of topics were, were handled um, in a, a few weeks. Um, so you moved to science documentaries, which were big, expensive, uh, sort of um, slow developing shows. Yes, I, I worked on a series called The Mind Machine, which had uh, Professor Colin Blakemore from Oxford uh, as the presenter. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful to have the contrast with Tomorrow's World, because the, this was a much more sort of thoughtful thing where you could really, um, you know, think about how to show people rather than tell people things. And uh, we had the most fantastic, um, you know, people taking part in it who'd had amazing things go wrong with their brains. And of course, you learn a lot about how brains work from how they go wrong. Well, it was always said that uh, researching a Horizon programme was the equivalent of taking a PhD in the subject you were actually making the programme about. So long program, so long form was it, and so intense an experience. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, um, I'm not sure I uh, would put myself on a par with people who've done a PhD in neurophysiology, but I, uh, <laughs> I certainly learnt a lot from, from doing that. And you did quite a lot of programmes. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, in the end, I became an executive producer, and so I was looking after other other producers. And uh, I think in all about fifty series or pro programs and series, all all sorts of things that um, were to do with uh, popular science, one way or another. And you had to do the budgets and all that kind of thing as well. Uh, well, I had quite a lot of help with people doing the budget. I was responsible for the budget, but um, there was always someone better than me at doing the sums. Um, I mean, it wasn't so much the sums, but the kind of um, the strategy of, of, of best use of money. I, I learned to actually rather love accountants. And then you were promoted into, into actually managing a, a, a real BBC career, this was looking like. Well, you say that, but I, I think that, um, you know, as soon as you're, as, as soon as you have anyone working for you, and, and in television, you know, that might be a designer or a, a sound recordist or a film cameraman or whoever it is, you're in management. And so, you know, running a department actually was just a sort of natural progression. And I think one of the things about me because of that engineering background um, and the craft background is that I was always quite hands on with still carrying on making things. So even now I still make the odd film. And of course, um, great big techno technology change was beginning to sweep into the BBC just as you got into managing. I, I remember. <laughs> Uh, going to visit the, um, a friend who was working at the National Physical Laboratory and uh, he had on his screen uh, the first web browser and uh, he, he said to me, John, you know what, I think the internet could be big and uh, I, I, I remember suggesting in the BBC that we, we start an internet club, uh, you know, in the early days and it was all going famously and then at one point I made the mistake of of saying in a in a sort of uh, you know a, a rather large meeting of, of uh, management at the BBC, I, I said that the internet could at some stage even be bigger than the BBC, and they they all sort of looked at me as if I I was completely daft, and that probably set the project back by about six months. I can remember um, not making a program about the internet because I couldn't find a way of actually 
making it understandable to anybody who'd never encountered it before. And uh, that wasn't that long ago, you know, 25 years ago or something. Quite extraordinary. And those days have gone very quickly. So uh, you, you sort of uh, went up the system and eventually became editorial director. Were you the first editorial director for BBC Online? Yes, I think I was. Uh, that was in about 1998 or something like that. God, it was it a new like... empire being formed, effectively, was it? Um, yeah, it was an odd thing because, uh, you know, th th uh, people were fiddling around quite quite rightly with the internet in all sorts of um, corners of the BBC. And of course, it was like the Wild West. So I, I think when I um, took over in that job, we had uh, eight Edinburgh Festival websites and five Doctor Who websites from the BBC because, you know, was it drama? Was it kids? Was it sort of Manchester? Was it, you know, so everyone had a, had a go at it. And uh, my my first job was to try and rationalise all that navigation across the across the BBC. And were there cultural clashes going on all the time? Was the, um, um, uh, the online clashing with the traditional broadcasters? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there was a sort of, there was a, a clash in terms of control because everyone in broadcasting wants to control everything. Um, uh, but there was also a clash in terms of philosophy, really, because I had come from education uh, the education part of the BBC, um, uh, you know, in just preceding that job. And of course, in education, what you're trying to do is to engage people to do something else after the programme. And so the internet was just absolutely sort of perfect. Whereas for the broadcast, traditional broadcasters, the very last thing they wanted them to do was to do anything other than watch television. So um, there, there was a sort of philosophical uh, disparity there, I suppose. And, and you know, that um, the way things are now where the the interaction can feed back into the programme and, and, and round in a virtuous circle, that, that was virtually unknown then. It occurs to me, too, that this was kind of outside the licence fee remit. So you were you were charting a new way into uncharted waters with not really knowing whether the BBC had any right to be there. Well, the, the, the part of the BBC's charter is actually to, to do new things, to investigate new ways of broadcasting. That absolutely is in the charter. Um, and so, you know, uh, there was a time when it was absolutely clear that that's what we should be doing. Once, the, uh, once they became sort of services that would then compete with, with uh, the private sector, then that became another matter. Now, all this excitement going on, and you leave the BBC. Why? <laughs> well, uh, you know, anyone with a, a sensible... It was about job, 20 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, it was about 1998. Um, and uh, anyone with a, a sort of sensible job with internet in their job title at the time um, was being called up by headhunters and companies uh, eager for, for recruitment. And... Uh, you know, I was very happy in the BBC and I um, uh, used to answer these questions, you know, that I'd get the phone call and, and uh, say, look, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. And there was an American company called Scient who just thought that that obviously is my first line of negotiation. <laughs> and so they kept upping the salary, uh, I'm afraid, to the point where I thought, well, you know, uh, my parents as first generation, second generation immigrants, they, you know, it wasn't a sort of a, a, a lavish in terms of material things, childhood, I, I thought, well, maybe this is the time to cash in. And so I went to uh, an American e-business company that was and, and was managing director of their London arm. And uh, in the end, the, you know, of course, all that um, collapsed after a couple of years because of the, the first internet boom, uh, you know, was sort of based on hubris. Um, but I uh, actually learned and earned quite a lot in that period and then when I had the option to go back to the BBC uh, they were terribly nice to me I um, I decided to sort of strike out on my own and I did a uh, set up a consulting company which actually still runs but the, um, uh, the one of the first consulting uh, jobs was with the DCMS the Department for Culture Media and Sport um, who had this wonderful idea uh, or they thought it was a wonderful idea to um, set up a culture portal for the nation can you imagine the government setting up a culture portal for the nation and uh, they wanted, uh, they'd had McKinsey in, who uh, obviously said it was a grand idea and charged them a lot to tell them that. And uh, I came along and said, I think that's a terrible idea. I can't imagine anything worse than government getting involved directly in culture. Um, you know, can't you do something more arm's length and maybe create 
uh, sort of models um, for the way that uh, interaction could work with audiences in new ways and pave the way for uh, the private sector and the public sector to collaborate in new ways um, with, with sort of model frameworks and, mo mo and model formats. And they said, well, that's a terrific idea. We, we'd much prefer to do that because it'll cost us a tenth of the price. Uh, would you like to come and run it? So, so I did that for a few years and wishing, of course, that I hadn't bargained them down in quite that <laughs> in terms of the money. Well, but the, job, the, um, the job sounded as though you were doing the old job, actually. Director for cultural, Culture Online sounds as though you'd got the job that you dismissed. Do you know, I nearly, at the BBC, I nearly had the job title of Controller Internet, which is like kind of Orwellian <laughs> controller of the world, isn't it? <laughs> I'd have loved that. Anyway, um, did the government understand the digital revolution then? Because the, uh, uh, it was getting a lot of publicity, but uh, uh, there were sort of first adopters thought they'd mastered it, didn't they? Well... You know, people talk about government as if it's just one thing, um, and it, you know, it, it isn't. And there were bits of government, I think, that have, you know, even even then mastered it well, and 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 actually now have mastered it very well. So I would say that the, um, uh, odd, oddly enough, I'd say Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs (HMRC) is actually not terrible, um, you know, to to deal with online. Uh, there are other bits of sort of government stuff that, uh, that uh, you know, are, are sort of pretty hopeless. Um, uh, you know, National Health Service, not really brilliant online. And uh, the, you know, even in those days, I think there were, you know, there were people doing great things. And there are other people who saw it as um, broadcasting, but in another, in another uh, you know, in another format, in another channel. And that's a dangerous thing with, with such an interactive uh, you know, sort of medium. And at the same time, the, the concept of democracy, parliamentary democracy, voting once every five years, people are voting thousands of times a week now in the choices they make and the likes they make on the social networking. That's a, a big challenge to the way a, an MP or a rising politician thinks about things. Yeah, and I mean, it, it affects the way we think about uh, representational democracy. Um, it absolutely uh, affects the way that people uh, sort of the expectations they have, um, you know, that uh, people uh, expect immediate results. They expect immediate reactions to their actions um, and they uh, expect the kind of standard of service that you get from the likes of Amazon, you know, that... Uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that uh, that go along with this, uh, not least, you know, the, the, the service side, but also our attitudes towards uh, transparency and privacy and, uh, you know, the, the use of our data. All these things are, are, are very difficult, very vexed, and they vary an enormous amount from culture to culture. So if you go to Germany, which has recent experience, uh, you know, of East Germany, the Stasi controlling everything and eavesdropping on everything, they have a completely different view to the British attitude about about privacy, you know. That, so so finding a sort of a European way towards um, towards a sort of common attitude, a common set of principles around privacy, is very hard when you've got countries that are as different as, um, as as Spain, Italy, and Germany. That brings a very big question, of course. Where are we now in the digital revolution? It looks as though we are in the the great discovery stage when um, all the new companies doing search and 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 um, uh, and um, commerce and things were enabling us to do far more than we could do before. At the same time, switch this, and you've got these huge new accumulating data centers that know more about us than anybody has ever known in the history of the world. Big Brother, and this is a very uneasy balance that's now developing, isn't it? Yeah, so there's also an enormous first mover advantage. So, um, you know, uh, one of the things I rather like about markets is where there's good competition between between people. And, and, and actually, it's very difficult for people to come in and compete with Facebook and Amazon and, and Google, which is why their share prices are so, so you know, fantastically high and why they're such good investments. Um, the, you know, it's, uh, you know, so that that sort of uh, possession of the data and the first mover 
kind of thing is, is very important. And then, of course, the, the way that society, as if there's such a th one thing as society, is uh, the, the way that we uh, want to have a relationship with those companies, which, which is not kind of any one thing, um, that hasn't kept pace uh, with the technical development. So our laws, our regulation and so on. Um, so the technology companies race ahead and do, uh, you know, what they want, essentially, which is to, you know, please their shareholders. Um, and the, the sort of regulation, if we want any, um, is, is sort of lagging far, far behind. And, and, you know, and the national debate as well about what, what we want and don't want. I have to point out you gave a very interesting TED talk at the uh, Houses of Parliament uh, about six years ago on this, which I think still think is is rather relevant in this context. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, I I um uh, I think I'm probably better known for the TED talks I've done on on plants and sex life of flowers and things like that. <laughs> but yes, I did. I did very do relevant that. to what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, um, you, you remember that? Sorry, just yes, to, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I, you know, I have a personal interest in this, um, you know, democracy thing, because my uh, father fled a country, you know, as a result of be becoming a refugee, because the whole place fell apart, you know, all the sort of natural uh, systems and checks and balances and everything else just fell apart. And so I have a particular Poland, Poland. interest in, in kind of stable democracy. Well, you went on from the Department of... Um culture, music and sport, into all sorts of other things, some of which perhaps you can, you can mention. Nesta was one. The, uh, you were picking winners there, were you? You were helping Nesta, this government investment fund, pick winners. That's an interesting, controversial thing still to do. Uh, yeah, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested in that area where public and private meet. Um, the, there are certain things that the public sector are... Um, you know, a, a well place to do. So museums, galleries, um, where there's market failure, um, you know, where, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, there are terrific things that could be going on, but they're not because nobody wants to take the kind of risk at the outset, you know, all, all those things where, where actually the public sector does great. Then there are other things where the public sector just does it abysmally. And the last thing you want is, uh, you know, I am old enough to remember when you couldn't find a phone box that worked anywhere in London and getting a phone line was a disaster and all the rest of it. Um, you know, who would want the government to run telecoms, uh, in my view? And I know other people may be different. Um, but, you know, so to me, there isn't one kind of uh, solution for everything. But I can see points where you really want to get public and private working together. And that's the, the bit where I, I think um, that's what Nesta was trying to do. And that's what we tried to do in this project called Culture Online, which I, 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 I sort of um, set up and ran in, in, in government uh, later on, which was, you know, that, that sort of, um, you know, you want to take culture and the arts to new audiences using new techniques, um, but you really need to uh, get the kind of the big, um, arts organisations, the galleries, the museums involved, but with with small companies doing their really inventive thing, and then some magic happens. Tell me about your the proliferation of your other interests: a trustee at Kew Gardens, at the Eden Project in Cornwall, the Raspberry Pi Foundation that makes these tiny computers for. Well, it started off in education; it's now rather wider than that, but it's a non-profit the Woodland Trust, visiting professor at Bristol University, specialising in science misconceptions. Learning, I suppose, is at the heart of most of those, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think education and, and uh, the way that, uh, you know, brains learn from other brains is, is at the heart of it. And then the two areas that I happen to be particularly interested in would be, um, it, it, you know, plants and environment on the one hand and technology on the other. And, uh, you know, that the technology, because that's, you know, the degree I did, and that was the way my way into so much else. Um, and then environment, because, uh, you know, and, and, and plants, because I think I got that from my, my parents. And all these, all these specific interests, you find time to allot bits of your mind to them, do you? Um, you know, the way you present it, they sound as if they're all terribly disparate. 
um, but I I don't see them that way. And uh, you know, to to me, they they are you know the sort of technology, education, environment, plants thing. They they're all um, uh, you know they they have certain things at heart uh, which are sort of you know a, a, a grounding in education, I suppose, and in public communication of these things. Uh, that is is my niche, I guess, and then you know one can apply that to different things. Science misconceptions. Um, uh, okay, so so the way that one. came about, and so I'll I'll explain the way that came about <laughs> was um, when I worked on Tomorrow's World at the BBC and various other documentaries. We did research to see um, whether people enjoyed them, uh, and we also did research to see whether people had learned from them. Uh, and the results were um, that people, uh, they, they loved the programmes, and obviously I wouldn't be telling you if they hadn't, um, but they learned hardly anything. And I was interested to find out why that was, uh, that, uh, you know, they, they found these programmes incredibly motivational. And lots of people would say, do you know, the reason I went into science was because I watched this programme or that programme. It was lovely. Uh, but actually, when you tested them about what they'd learned, very little. And uh, so I wanted to find out why that was. And so I did some research, uh, commissioned some research when I was at the BBC um, uh, with various science organizations around the world and education organizations. And we, we found that there were some, uh, you know, terrible misconceptions that kids developed at a very, very young age. And that their, um, that these would sort of percolate into society because actually we never leave those misconceptions behind. So for example, if I ask, um, why is it hotter in summer than in winter? Most people, 85% of the group every year, and these are people with science degrees, say because we're closer to the sun. And we learn at a very tiny age that, you know, the closer you get to something that, uh, that's hot, the more likely you are to burn yourself. So it's almost unshakable, the idea that it's closer to the sun in summer. But of course, what happens in Australia where, you know, do we sort of rush towards the sun every night and, you know, or every day and back during the night or something? Um, you know, the, it, it can't be that. And yet we still hold that in our heads. If you ask people, where does, you know, a little seed weighs next to nothing and a big tree weighs an enormous amount and a bag of charcoal that you made out of the tree weighs a lot. So where did all the stuff come from? And... 85% uh, again, 85% of any audience you ask will say it came out of the ground. And yeah, I don't know how it is where you live, but where I live, we don't have lorries driving around every night, filling in all the earth that the trees have taken out. Um, I hardly ever have to top up the, the, the soil in my pot plant, and yet it's grown like topsy. Um, it comes out of the air. It's, you know, the heavy stuff is carbon dioxide from the air and all of the bag of the carbon uh, charcoal is carbon. All of that bag of charcoal is carbon and all of that came out of the air. And that's what trees do for a living. That's what plants do for a living. And so those misconceptions I found very, very interesting. OK, let's go to the book then. Around the World in 80 Trees. It's very good looking. It's even slightly tree shaped. It's got dozens of wonderful pictures by the French illustrator Lucille Clark or Clerk. Um, a wonderful, a wonderful illustrator. Uh, but you had a long standing interest in trees, did you, Jonathan? This wasn't out of the blue, was it? Yeah, I, what I'm going to try and do is share my screen for a second. And uh, forgive me if the technology doesn't work, I'll just do my, do my best here. Um, and uh, if I share that one and do that, uh, then uh, can you see a blue screen at the moment? Does yes, we can. Um, okay, let's see whether this works. Well, there's, there's me, uh, age six or seven, uh, at Kew Gardens uh, with my dad. Uh, you can tell the immigrant status because he's wearing a suit to go to, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to Kew Gardens on a Saturday afternoon. And the way that he got my brother and me interested in, uh, in plants uh, was to feed us bits of them. Uh, so the one on the left you might recognize is Diffenbachia. It's a, um, known as dumb canes. It's a, a pot plant that usually comes with a warning that says, do not feed to children or animals. And I remember him, him giving me a, a little piece of that. And, um, 
uh, saying, this will burn your mouth. And I want, I'm going to tell you a really important story about this. And uh, he gave me a tiny piece and it was like having needles in my mouth. And indeed, the cells uh, of the plant contain these tiny uh, needle-like structures, which accelerate the poison through the, your uh, mucous membranes in your mouth. And uh, he said, the reason I'm telling you this story is because this was um, what was given to slaves in the south, uh, deep south of the United States in the time of slavery. And I'm gonna tell you about slavery through this plant. And he told me the, the story of slavery and the, the slave trade. And, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting necessarily that this is how we should teach all children. <laughs> we might not get the risk assessment form signed, but um, it stuck in my mind. And it was the way he told us uh, about plants. The one on the right there you probably recognize, or you may recognize, is an opium poppy. And I remember him uh, taking one of those at Kew and uh, uh, cutting it just like that and giving me a lick of it. And it felt ever so slightly numb on my tongue. It didn't do anything else. But the main effect that it had was when I, um, when I told my teacher at school, and I remember the social worker arriving at my, <laughs> my house and my mum with that great piece of rhetoric in her broad Scots accent saying, but, but you know, what's the problem? It's only opium. <laughs> um, but that is how uh, my dad got us uh, interested in, the, um, in plants. Why did he have such an acute uh, and uh, teaching knowledge of, of all this? Um, well, he had studied botany, but, um, uh, you know, when he came to Britain, uh, they didn't really need botanists. What they needed was engineers. So he retrained in engineering and worked for Harland and Wolf shipyards in Glasgow, um, sort of, uh, you know, and, and, and worked his way up in management there and, and kind of was responsible for, uh, you know, building ships to replace the ones that had been lost in the convoys. So this tree, this tree book is a kind of honouring him, is it? Uh, well, and my mum, who, um, you know, was uh, fantastically motivated by the beauty of plants. And when she died, um, uh, I remember in her purse, she had uh, one of those fantastic sort of uh, jeweller's uh, magnifying glasses that she used to go around and look at little structures in, in leaves and things, not because she was scientific in any way. I mean, she used to believe the most incredibly pseudo-scientific stuff, but she, she loved the beauty of it. You've had a question about the wonderful illustrations. Where did you find um, Lucille Clerk? Well, the, the publisher, I really lucked out with, um, with Lawrence King, uh, the, the publisher, and they, um, they found her, or they found several possibilities, and we, we discussed the work. And, and uh, there's something about her work, which is very, um, uh, I think the French word is insolite. Uh, in, in English, it translates into unsolid, which isn't, there's a sort of wistfulness about it, which I which I really like. So, um, and she managed to capture the essence of the uh, of, of the different species in the book. And they are a pretty tremendous species. Trees are going to outlive the human race, aren't they? Um, <laughs> it depends. It depends exactly how we die out. If it's a nuclear holocaust, they might not. Um, but yes, I would think that uh, there are lots of. Um, plants that would probably outlast humans uh, the way we're acting. Do trees actually communicate as I think at least one fairly recent book claims? Yeah I mean information is transferred between trees um, but uh, you know whether they actively communicate the word communicate in the way that you've used it implies a sort of sentience and uh, I don't think that we have any evidence that trees are sentient but there are networks of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi that connect up um, tree roots with the soil and enable the trees to get chemicals from the soil that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get and the fungi in return get sugars from the tree. And those fungal networks can actually connect up with other trees. And through those networks, you not only get you know, various sugars and things being transferred between species, uh, but you also get um, you know, if a tree is being attacked by, a, you know, a, a load of locusts or a, some caterpillars or something, then signals are sent, which other trees um, can uh, pick up on, I would put it that way, and can react to and start making their own defence chemicals. That's trees in general. Let's talk about trees 
in particular now, because this is a book of 80 trees, and some of them you like better than others or find more fascinating than others. So tell us about them. OK, well, so uh, I've got uh, a few images here. The, the, um, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, share my screen again and just see whether this works for you. Uh, so can you see the opium poppy again? Mm. Good. Okay. So, so the, the, the book is, a, um, uh, is about eight, is, is 80 biographies, really, of different species and the way that our lives are entangled with um, the, the sort of plant science. And obviously trees have uh, evolved for their own purposes, not for us. And, but some of the, the, the reasons that they've evolved um, have been very, very useful to humans. So just one of the themes that runs through the book is, is plant defense. So plants can't up sticks and run away. Um, and uh, they have various means, if I can change the slide, um, uh, of, of defending themselves. These are cowrie trees. Um, I, I hope you can see that illustration. Is that clear? Yes, it's fine. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, so, so these are cowrie trees from the Northern Ireland of New Zealand, and uh, they, uh, like many trees, have resins that they uh, use to seal wounds and to, um, to sort of kill bacteria and, and engulf insects and so on. Those resins that they use for defence uh, have been very useful to people. Um, in the uh, mid-19th century, uh, resin prospectors uh, arrived from all over the world. 10,000 people arrived to prospect for resin, just in the way that the Californians had a gold rush. And uh, the reason for it was that this was the one material that could be used to make outdoor varnish uh, for the British Empire. And uh, New Zealand uh, taxed this, and uh, the tax money paid for the, the whole of the sort of modern infrastructure of modern New Zealand, uh, which included, of course, uh, ironically, clearing the forests. But these resin prospectors would, would find huge lumps uh, by, by sort of dr uh, drilling down with a twangy, twangy pole and sort of twanging it and listen, listen for the tone. Um, gutta percha um, uh, from a tree in Borneo is another resin that um, uh, was used uh, first of all, for making all these kind of wonderful kitchen implements and things, and it, it, it was actually a sort of latex. Um, same, same purpose for the plant, uh, but it changed the world uh, because this was the one material that could be used for, um, this, was a, this is a phrase you weren't thinking you were going to hear tonight, but the, uh, uh, for insulating submarine cables. And if you can insulate submarine cables, then nation can talk to nation. And the gutta percha tree um, plantations and plantations of it enabled cables to span the earth and after a few decades there were 250,000 miles of gutta percha insulated cables around the world all based on a material that the tree uses to engulf insects. The jarra tree from, uh, uh, from uh, Western Australia at one point um, uh, all the swankiest streets in London were paved in jarra wood this is before tarmac, so this is around the end of the 19th century. And um, uh, before that, they'd used a rather sort of cheap and nasty wood uh, from uh, the, the sort of Hanseatic countries around the Baltic. And uh, when carts and horses went over them, it would sort of spray horses pee at, at passers-by. They weren't very happy about this. Um, and jarrow wood was uh, imported all the way from Australia to, um, uh, you know, to take its place. And... Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of wonderful wood, and there is one street in London, in Islington, that still has jarrow wood paving. Uh, but, uh, you know, at one point in time, Piccadilly, everywhere else that was paved, paved with jarrow. Um, this is the um, uh, Japanese lacquer tree, and uh, on the left, uh, sorry, on my left, you see a guy with the tree and all that. Um, and lacquer is the most amazing material, you know, it's a plastic kind of material. Uh, so the sap, very, very poisonous. Uh, painted on in layers and, and makes this, uh, this, um, uh, this amazing kind of plasticky material. Uh, in the days before plastics, this would have been an incredible thing, waterproof. Uh, but uh, this tree uh, has a sort of another side to its history, which is that, um, you know, Japanese monks in a, in a rather strange sect in northern Japan, 
up until the 19th century used to uh, drink a tea made out of this material and sort of embalm themselves while they were still alive. It's rather disgusting actually. And uh, they would eventually die very emaciated and very plastic. And uh, they would be dug up uh, after uh, a year. And if they hadn't rotted, which they probably wouldn't have because of all the chemicals in this, um, they, uh, even, even maggots wouldn't want to eat them. Uh, they would be regarded as a sort of, it was a kind of path to instant Buddhahood um, and uh, if, they, if their body was still preserved. And it was only outlawed in the late 19th century, uh, this. But that, that's a, an example on the right hand side of this sort of wonderful illustration that, um, uh, that Lucille has done. The alder tree, um, which is so familiar, grows near water, fights off rot so well, fights off rot so well that the Venetians built the Ponte Vecchio and the rest of Venice on alder wood piles, which exist still to this day after 500 years. Alder wood also makes the best gunpowder. Um, and uh, it, uh, because it makes the best charcoal, not only does it make the, be make the best gunpowder, but it also makes uh, the very best steel. And so uh, the Venetians projected their power throughout the Mediterranean by, uh, on the basis of alderwood, uh, steel, gunpowder, and the ability that that gave them to, um, uh, you know, destroy the, the opposition. Uh, at the height of their power, the Venetians uh, could build one ocean going warship completely fitted out with all the explosives and steel and everything else um, from this fantastic uh, city built on alder. Uh, they could build one warship per day. I mean, that is amazing uh, in a production line which was known as the Arsenale, which has given us the word arsenal. And um, finally, uh, this is uh, the beech tree, which has a, a, a sort of extraordinary, uh, the two things that I really love about this. The first is that uh, the Germans have a, a, a saying that lightning never strikes a beech tree. And the uh, the reason for that is not because lightning doesn't strike a beech tree, because it strikes them just as often as, as any other tree, but because when the lightning strikes, the outside of the tree is going to be wet, right, because it's during a storm. And beech trees have very, very smooth bark because they're constantly replacing all those little sort of cells uh, in a way that other bark doesn't. So instead of the um, electricity being diverted down the middle of the tree as it would with an oak tree where parts of the bark are dry and parts are wet. This acts like a lightning conductor and the, the electricity flows down the outside of the tree, leaving the tree unharmed. So that's one of the things I love about the, the beech tree. And the other tr thing I love about it is that this for me would be the stationer's tree. Um, and the, the reason for that is that almost everything to do with the beech is to do with writing. So people carve their names on, on this smooth bark. It's like a, a, a blank sheet of paper. Uh, Virgil, a uh, great hypocrite that he was, uh, he, he said, um, you know, it's awful these people carving their names on, on, on beech trees. And then he did it himself. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but the, uh, in every language in Europe, the word beech and the word book are related. Uh, the boards that made old books were made out of beech wood um, because it didn't warp. And uh, Bücher and Buch in German are, are, are obviously related. Book and beech in English. Um, uh, Rembrandt used beech gall to make his ink. Uh, writing desks were made from beech. Uh, it's just got one meaning after another to do with writing and books. And, and for me, I think that would be the stationer's tree. Uh, oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. I've been yakking on long enough. Thank, thanks for that lovely sampling of a beautiful book. And um, Louise Stadel asks, where are the, uh, what's happened to the illustrations? Are you, is somebody selling the illustrations? Well, of course they, and they, them because they're, they're, they're marvellous, aren't they? Um, the, the I, I have one of them. Uh, the uh, originals are with Lucille and, uh, you know, who... Uh, I mean, she's such a talent, um, and uh, she lives in Stoke Newington in London, and um, uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure working for her. I had good training working with highly strong um, creative people at the BBC, and uh, that was good training for this. And Margaret Wills asked where the street in Islington is. Ah, uh, yikes. I, yeah, I, I, I know where it is, uh, but I've forgotten the name of it. It's, um, it, there's a... Uh, 
there's a housing estate. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll, I'll... I've certainly ridden over streets where the blocks are very close to the surface on my way into London through Islington, but I don't know whether they were in Islington or not. You do see woodblock streets still. Um, I will, um, uh, maybe at the end, I could just put up my email address and she could email yeah, me. And, yeah, and, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm Lovely. sorry, um, I just can't remember. The, beach, the stationers would be a beech tree. What about you? What tree are you? Well, uh, it's, it was actually, uh, sorry, who did you say had asked the question then? Which one? Uh, the one that you just asked me. This is my tr my question. This one. Oh no, no. The um, uh, I uh, wanted to know where the Islington yeah, Street. Yeah, is. it, so someone has actually put it's Checker Street. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. Okay. So the reason I was asking is because uh, if I uh, do this, sorry, uh, I've got a picture of the tree I would like to be. Um, sorry, it's got some other information on there, but if you want to get in touch, you can. This this is um, a, a quiver tree. Um, and it's related to the aloe, the aloe vera that you, uh, you know, know from cosmetics and so on. And uh, that tree is actually about 50 feet high. Uh, the reason it doesn't look quite that is because I'm quite close to the camera jumping there. Um, I thought it was the, holding you. <laughs> that's in the Namibian desert. And the reason I love this tree, uh, or if, if I was a tree, this is the one I'd want to be, is not because it's the most fantastically resilient thing in a very, very harsh landscape, though that's true, but because um, when you go up to this tree, the two things about it, one is that it's the national tree of Namibia. So it's like driving a Morris Minor. When anyone sees it, they laugh, they smile, they're happy. Um, and the second reason is that it's got this funny white powdery coating, which you, you maybe can or can't see in that picture. So people go and sort of touch it. And the idea of being a tree that people want to touch and smile at and stroke maybe, I think that's the tree I'd like to be. What's the next book, Jonathan? It's written already, it must be, if it's coming out in April. Yeah, it's um, uh, the, the format uh, of this, the Around the World and 80 Trees, worked so surprisingly well. I mean, I didn't have any, uh, I mean, to say it was beyond my wildest dreams, I, I didn't have any dreams for it, so it was easy to be beyond the wildest dreams, but it did very well. Uh, the combination of uh, sort of um, science and folklore and culture and history and illustration and so on. Um, so I've, I've done the same format again, I'm afraid, uh, and it's called Around the World and 80 Plants, and about a quarter of those are trees, and uh, the rest are all, all sorts of other plants from around the world, where I felt that there was something that was worthwhile and new to say, um, uh, which is sort of quite difficult given the number of plant and tree books there are around. Uh, uh, similar, same illustrator? Oh yeah, very much so. Uh, yeah. I mean, and um, uh, you know, I, I was just delighted to be able to work with her again. Um, trees are on a different time scale from we humans, aren't they? I've seen bristlecone pines still growing four hundred, four thousand years old, and bits of them lying around on the hillside dead, but still there, and they're 8,000 years old, and suddenly it puts puny man into some sort of perspective. Why do we have such difficulty planning ahead? Uh, well, you know, there are two, two things there. there. What, one is the sort of the amazing thing about trees, that they can last so many generations of the things that would eat them. So all those little critters that go and attack, attack trees, um, you know, they're going through sometimes thousands of generations of evolution and the tree still has to be able to defend itself. So that is an amazing kind of science thing. And then you ask the question about people um, and what it is about, about us that makes us, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, your implication was that trees plan ahead. I don't think that they do that. They just sort of evolve to sort of, happen to be that way but the the thing about people is that we're programmed to fight and flight um you know we we react to things that change rapidly um and that's why as a species we're just sort of desperately bad at planning for pandemics you know we knew uh you know 
pretty much clearly that you know in 2005 or six that this was to happen at some point but you know the world didn't plan for it we know that climate change is happening um uh you know we can see the effects of it uh but uh we you know we either sort of don't do anything about it or we kind of deny it so the reasons for denying it which are very sort of human about not wanting to deal with difficult stuff um but the uh, the reasons for not planning for it are because I think we're programmed for the short term. You know, it's much easier for us to deal with the kind of put, putting my hand on something that's hot and reacting to it than it is to think about something that's, um, you know, we, we just haven't evolved to, to deal with those sort of time things happening on, on a long time scale. I mean, the, the people who, you know, farmers plan ahead, uh, they, they, they sort of plan ahead a, a kind of a, f a few years. Uh, one of the things that um, I don't altogether approve of everything the Victorians did, but they did plan ahead a long way with their trees. So if you look in London and you look at the magnificent plane trees that were planted, the, you know, there are a lot of plane trees that were planted like in Berkeley Square and so on in the 1760s or so. But um, uh, the big planting was in Victorian times. And, and the, you know, those plane trees didn't look great when they planted them. But they knew that in 150 years they would look fantastic lofty branches architectural showing off you know that archi london's architecture pomp and circumstance fantastic confidence of being the center of an empire wonderful really plan in, in the stationer's garden too but uh, a beautiful beautiful tree there yeah um how do two writers work together in the same house your wife is the novelist tracy chevalier how do you do it <laughs> <laughs> by, by being by, by being in separate rooms <laughs> and um, we don't we don't show each other our uh, drafts for anything I mean you know Tracy is is someone who I would call a proper writer you know I mean she she has made her living at writing for uh, many years I feel like I'm a, a, a dilettante and um, a, you know she is uh, sort of professional about it in the way that I I don't think I am I you know she will uh, settle down to a day's work at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, you know and, and clock off at uh, you know some sometime late afternoon having you know written solidly and and you know she takes it very very seriously um I fitted it in uh, along alongside all sorts of other things and uh you know we, it, it's if you if you're in a marriage I, you know that's a, a sort of a you know has to be a, a even, even though you do different things and you do them in different ways, you have to look on each other as equals. And having the person you love most critique your work, I can tell you, is a really, really bad idea. So we don't do that. <laughs> you discuss, do you discuss the book and the progress of the books? No. no. Oh, well, we say, you know, did you have a good day? Or uh, yeah. do you, um, uh, you know, and occasionally Tracy might ask me, because she's American, um, even though she's been living here for kind of 30 years, uh, she might ask, you know, is, d d to an English ear, does that sound bonkers? Uh, you know, is, is that crazy? Or I might ask her about something to do with American, you know, th th there's an American angle on some of the species here. But otherwise, no, we, we wait until we've done. <laughs> Martin Woodhead wants to know how to plant um, what he calls a bulb lasagna, um, an arrangement of about three bulbs in three layers. Any, any solution? Yeah, I think you should ask a horticulturalist. Um, and I, uh, you know, the, 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 reason I'll, the reason I'll never make a politician uh, is because, you know, rather than kind of bullshitting my way through the answer <laughs> or giving an answer to a completely different question, um, I, I'll just say, do you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. One of your TED Talks, this is sort of final question, alas, but... Uh, you can come back and talk about your new book again. And so, um, one of your TED Talks, you talk about known things about science and that we've already mentioned. And then you recommend fiddling with things, thinking by messing about, thinking like children. That's very important for all education. It takes us back to the way you started your interest in trees with your father in Kew Gardens, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I. You know, not everyone is like this. I'm not sure my son is like this. He's very sort of abstract and theoretical, and I, I'm not. Um, but in order for me to engage with things, I need to be able to at least mentally kind of take them apart, see how they work. 
and and often physically as well. I remember my um, the the sort of aha moment that I had when I moved from engineering into program making was when the BBC sent me on a course for an afternoon and put a proper camera in my hand. And I thought, gosh, you know, I could use this. Um, and I, I remember uh, with my parents, um, you know, that the, we would be out for a, for a walk. And I remember that, that time seeing fantastic cedar of Lebanon, which had been struck by lightning. And, you know, we were smelling the wood and we were tasting bits of it and we were kind of, uh, you know, climbing all over it and everything. And uh, I remember because it had been struck by lightning, it was, you know, it was being sawn up and it was dead, you know, and, and um, it was the first time I saw my father cry. And I remember thinking that, you know, I'd, I'd thought my parents were in benign control of everything. And, and of course, you know, finding that they weren't. And um, I, I remember my mother saying, I must have been about six, saying there was a whole world in that tree. And, and the, there's just something that, kind of lasted with me, you know, the idea that, the, that there was a whole world in that tree, and, and she meant it both physically and metaphorically. And I, I think um, it's that kind of uh, allowing yourself to be curious and, and more curious and allow myself to be more curious if I actually fiddle with stuff and make things. And children are naturally curious. Yeah, if and, and they need to be, in my view, encouraged. Um, you know, and I, 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 that's one of the, well, this is a whole other topic, but I think a lot of the, the way that we teach children sort of discourages um, curiosity. We can add that to the next book. It is, <laughs> this one is a wonderful book, as I hope uh, uh, we've enabled um, our um, party goers to, to sample. Uh, Mike. Wow, thank you guys. Um, that was absolutely fascinating and amazing. Um, John, you certainly have many more hours in your day than I do. Um, and I can only admire your, your, your passion, your passion about so many subjects. It was, it was incredible. And we're just so lucky as a stations company to have you as a senior member. So, so thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. Peter also. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, Peter, thank you also for your normal professional performance. It's just unfortunate that, that tonight I can't actually take you both out and buy you a a pint to say thank you on behalf of, of, of the company because that was actually cheers <laughs> that was absolutely incredible so let me close perhaps with something that, that, that John and Peter were talking about there a little quote from from the book um the first book sorry the first tree that is actually covered in the book is actually the London plain and John says London's plains are a glorious and imposing spectacle and a reminder of a time when this was the centre of the world. With large maple leaves and a towering height, the London Plain is a tree of pomp and circumstance, a symbol of a nation at the height of its powers. Well, I just hope that very soon that we will be in our garden at Stations Hall, underneath our plane tree, and we will be the actual leading station company, sorry, the leading livery company in the city again. So thank you everybody for, for tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. Um, maybe see you all again in an hour's time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you.